This afternoon, I'm going to be reading from uh, Spirit and Nature. Uh, this is from the papers of the Aranos Yearbooks, edited by Joseph Campbell. And I'm reading over the next few days an essay and presentation that Dr. Jung made in 1945 or 1946 at the Aranos Conferences. Um, and so yesterday I read part one. Uh, today I'm going to read part two. Two, the significance of the unconscious in psychology. The hypothesis of the unconscious puts a large question mark after the idea of the psyche. The soul, as hitherto postulated by the philosophical intellect and equipped with all the necessary faculties, threatened to emerge from its chrysalis as something with unexpected and uninvestigated properties. It no longer represented anything immediately known, about which nothing more remained to be discovered except a few more or less satisfying definitions. Rather, it now appeared in strangely double guise, as both known and unknown. All right, so I'm just going to re, uh, res resume. I'm gonna uh, start over, I guess, because I only was a few sentences into it. Okay, part two, the significance of the unconscious in psychology. The hypothesis of the unconscious puts a large question mark after the idea of the psyche. The soul, as hitherto postulated by the philo philosophical intellect and equipped with all the necessary faculties, threatened to emerge from its chrysalis as something with unexpected and uninvestigated properties. It no longer re represented anything immediately known about which nothing more remained to be discovered except a few more or less satisfying definitions. Rather, it now appeared in strangely double guise as both known and unknown. In consequence, the old, in consequence, the old psychology was thoroughly unseated and as much revolutionized as classical physics had been by the discovery of radioactivity. These first experimental psychologists were in the same predicament as the mythical discoverer of the numerical sequence who strung peas together in a row and simply went on adding another unit to those already present. When he, contem contem when he contemplated the result, it looked as if there were nothing but a hundred identical units, but the numbers he had thought of only as names unexpectedly turned out to be peculiar entities with irreducible properties. For instance, there were even uneven and primary numbers, positive, negative, and irrational, and imaginary numbers, etc. So it is with psychology. If the soul is really only an idea, this idea has an alarming air of unpredictability about it, something with qualities no one would ever have imagined. One can go on asserting that the soul is consciousness and its contents, but that's not, but that does not prevent, in fact, it hastens the discovery of a background not previously suspected, a true matrix of all conscious phenomena, a pre-consciousness and a post-consciousness, a super-consciousness and a subconsciousness. The moment one forms an idea of a thing and successfully catches one of its aspects, one invariably succumbs to the illusion of having caught the whole. One never considers that a total apprehension is right out of the question. Not even an idea posited as total is total, for it is still an entity on its own with unpredictable qualities. This self-deception certainly promotes peace of mind, 
the unknown is named, the, the far has been brought near so that one can lay one's figure on it. One has taken possession of it and it has become an inalienable piece of property, like a slain creature in the wild that can no longer run away. It is a magical, it is a magical procedure such as the primitive practices upon objects and the psychologist upon the soul. He is no longer at its mercy, but he never suspects that the very fact of grasping the object conceptually gives it a golden opportunity to display all those qualities which would never have been made, which would never have made their appearance had it not been imprisoned in a concept. Remember the numbers. The attempts that have been made during the last 300 years to grasp the soul are all part and parcel of, this, of that tremendous expansion of knowledge, which has brought the universe nearer to us in a way that staggers the imagination. The thousandfold, magnific the thousandfold magnifications made possible by the electron microscope by with the 500 million light year distances which the telescope travels. Psychology is still a long way from a development similar to that which the other natural sciences have undergone. Also, as we have seen, it has been much less able to shake off the trammels of philosophy. All the same, every science is a function of the soul and all knowledge is rooted in it. The psyche is the greatest of all cosmic wonders and the sine qua non of the world as, as an object. It is the highest degree, it is in the highest degree odd, it is in the highest degree odd that Western man with but very few and ever fewer exceptions apparently pays so little regard to this fact. Swamped by the knowledge of external objects, the subject of all knowledge has been temporarily eclipsed to the point of seeming non-existent. <clears throat> this is where Dr. Young in his interview with the BBC said, we know no thing about the psyche. <clears throat> And I've been saying for a long time, we need thousands of PhD theses <clears throat> on what is really happening in the psyche. <clears throat> Sorry, um, this is not a cold. This is not coronavirus. This is my spring allergies taking my throat apart. The soul was, the soul was a tacit assumption that seemed to know itself in every particular. With the discovery of a possible unconscious psychic realm, man had the opportunity to embark upon a great adventure of the spirit, and one might have expected that a passionate interest would be turned in this direction. Not only was this not the case at all, but there arose on all sides an outcry against such a hypothesis. Nobody drew the conclusion that if the subject of knowledge, the psyche, were in fact a veiled form of existence not immediately accessible to consciousness, then all our knowledge must be incomplete and moreover to a degree that we cannot determine. The validity of conscious knowledge was questioned in an altogether different and more menacing way than it had been ever been by the critical procedures of epistemology. The latter put certain bounds of human knowledge in general. I'm sorry. Okay, epistemology. The latter put certain bounds to human knowledge in general, from which post-Kantian German idealism struggled to emancipate itself. But, struck, but natural science and common sense 
accommodated themselves to it without much difficulty. If they condescended to notice it at all, philosophy fought against it in the interest of an antiquated pretension of the human mind to be able to pull itself up by its own bootstraps and know things that were right outside the range of human understanding. The victory of Hegel over Kant dealt the gravest blow to reason and to the further spiritual development of the German and then of the European mind, all the more dangerous as Hegel was a psychologist in disguise who projected great truths out of the sphere of the subject into a cosmos he himself had created. We know how far Hegel's influence extends today. The forces compensating this calamitous development personified themselves partly in the latter in the later Schelling, partly in Schopenhauer and Carew, while on the other hand, that unbridled bacchantic god whom Hegel had already scented in nature finally burst upon us in Nietzsche. Karras, Karras's hypothesis of the unconscious was bound to hit the then prevailing trend of German philosophy all the harder, as the latter had apparently just got the better of Kantian criticism and had restored or rather reinstated the well-nigh godlike sovereignty of the human spirit, spirit with a capital S. The spirit of medieval man was in good and bad alike, still the spirit of the God whom he served epistemological criticism was on the one hand an expression of the modesty of the medieval man and on the other hand a renunciation of an abdication from the spirit of God and consequently a modern extension and reinforcement of human consciousness within the limits of reason. Wherever the spirit of God is extruded from human calculations an unconscious substitute takes its place. In Schopenhauer, we find the unconscious will as the new definition of God. In Carew, the unconscious, and in Hegel, identification and inflation, the practical equation of philosophical reason with spirit, thus making possible the intellectual juggling with the object which achieves such a horrid brilliance in his philosophy of the state. Hegel offered a solution of the problem raised by epistemological criticism in that he gave ideas a chance to prove their unknown power of autonomy. They induced that hybris, hubris of reason which led to Nietzsche's Superman and hence to the catastrophe that bears the name of Germany. Not only artists, but philo philosophers too, are sometimes prophets. I think it is obvious that all philosophical statements which transgress the bounds, which transgress the bounds of reason are anthropomorphic and have no validity beyond that which falls in psychically conditioned statements. A philosophy like Hegel's is a self-revelation of the psychic background and a philosophically and philosophically a presumption. Psychologically, it amounts to an invasion by the unconscious. The peculiar high-flown language Hegel uses bears out this view. It is, re it is reminiscent of the megalomaniac it is reminiscent of the megalomaniac language of schizophrenics who use terrific spellbinding words to reduce the transcendent to subjective form, to give banalities the charm of novelty, to pass off commonplaces as searching wisdom. So bombastic in terminology is a symptom of weakness, ineptitude, and lack of substance. But that does not prevent the latest German philosophy from using the same crackpot power words and pretending that it is not unintentional psychology. 
in face of this elemental inrush of unconscious into the Western sphere of human reason, Schopenhauer and Carew had no solid ground under them from which to develop and apply their compensatory effect. Man's salutary submission to the benevolent deity and the cordon sanitaire between him and the demon of darkness, the great legacy of the past, remained unimpaired with Schopenhauer and at any rate in principle, while with Carew it was hardly touched at all since he sought to tackle the problem at the root by leading it away from the over-presumptuous philosophical standpoint towards that of psychology. We have to close our eyes to this philosophical allure if we wish to give full weight to his essentially psychological hypothesis. He had at least come a step nearer to the conclusion we mentioned earlier by trying to construct a world picture that included the dark part of the soul. The structure still lacked something whose unprecedented importance I would like to bring home to the reader. For this purpose, we must first make it clear to ourselves that all knowledge is the result of imposing some kind of order upon the reactions of the psychic system as they flow into our consciousness, an order which reflects the behavior of a metaphysical reality of that which is in itself real. If, as certain modern points of view too would have it, the psychic system coincides and is identical with our conscious mind, then in principle, we are in a position to know everything that can be known, i.e. everything that lies within the limits of the theory of knowledge. In that case, there is no cause for disquiet beyond that felt by anatomists and physiologists when contemplating the function of the eye or the organ of hearing. But should it turn out that the psyche does not coincide with consciousness, and what is more, that it functions unconsciously in a way similar to or different from the conscious portion of it, then our disquiet must rise to the point of agitation. For it is then no longer a question of general epistemological limits, but of a flimsy threshold that separates us from the unconscious contents of the psyche. The hypothesis of the threshold and of the unconscious means that the indispensable raw material of all knowledge, namely psychic reactions, and perhaps even unconscious thoughts and insights lie close beside, above, or below consciousness, separated from us by the merest threshold, and yet apparently unattainable. We have no knowledge of how this unconscious functions, but since it is conjectured to be a psychic system, it may possibly have everything that consciousness has, including perception, a perception, memory, imagination, will, affectivity, feeling, reflection, judgment, etc., all in subliminal forms. Here we are faced with one subjection that one cannot possibly seek of unconscious perceptions, representations, feelings, much less of volitional actions, seeing that none of these phenomena can be represented without an experiencing subject. Moreover, the idea of a threshold presupposes a mode of ob observation in terms of energy according to which consciousness is psychic content consciousness of psychic contents is essentially dependent upon their intensity, that is, their energy. As just as only a stimulus of a certain intensity is powerful enough to cross the threshold, so it may with so it may with justice be assumed that other psychic contents too must possess a higher energy potential if they are to get across. If they possess only a small amount of energy, they remain subliminal, like the corresponding sense perceptions. 
As Lips has already pointed out, the first objection is nullified by the fact that the psychic process remains essentially the same, whether it is represented or not. Anyone who takes the view that the phenomena of consciousness comprise the whole psyche must go a step further and say that representations, which we do not have, can hardly be described as representations. He must also deny any psychic quality to what is left over. For this rigorous point of view, the psyche can only have the phantasmagoric existence that pertains to the ephemeral phenomena of consciousness. This view does not square with common experience, which speaks in favor of a possible psychic activity without consciousness. Lips I, Lips's idea of the ex, Lips's idea of the existence of psychic processes on sick as such does not does more justice to the facts. I do not wish to waste time in proving this point but will content myself with saying that never yet, but will content myself with saying that never yet has any reasonable person doubted the existence of psychic processes in a dog. Although no dog has to our knowledge ever expressed consciousness of its psychic contents. <laughs> Okay, so that was part two, and tomorrow I will be reading part three, which is called the, Dissoci the Dissociability of the Psyche. Um, I'm just looking at the footnotes to see if there's something essential that I must give you. Okay, there, there's one um, quote here uh, where Dr. Yang is talking about the numbers and there's a footnote after the numbers where he had referred to uh, primary numbers and uneven and even and positive and negative and irrational and imaginary numbers. And the footnote reads, a mathematician once remarked that everything in science was man-made except numbers which had been created by God himself. Okay. <laughs> okay, there's another footnote here that's probably worth reading. Let me find where it refers. Okay, I've got it. So in the text it reads, um, Rather, it now appeared in strangely double guise as both known and unknown. In consequence, the old psychology was thoroughly unseated and as much revolutionized as classical physics had been by the discovery of radioactivity. And the footnote reads, I reproduce here what William James says about the importance of the discovery of the unconscious psyche in by varieties of religious experience, New York, 1902, page 233. Quote, I cannot but think that the most important step forward that has occurred in psychology since I have been a student of that science is the discovery first made in 1886 that there is not only the consciousness of the ordinary field with its usual center and margin, but in addition there too in the shape of a set of memories, thoughts and feelings, which are extra marginal and outside the primary consciousness altogether, but yet must be classed as conscious facts of some sort, able to reveal their presence by unmistakable signs. I call this the most important step forward because unlike the other advances which psychology has made, this discovery has revealed to us an entirely unsuspected peculiarity in the constitution of human nature. No other step forward would, which psychology has made can offer any such claim as this. 
the discovery of 1886, to which James is, re, is depositing of, is a subliminal consciousness by Friedrich W.H. Myers. Okay, so that's a reference to people starting to think about uh, psychology. Yeah, I guess there's one more that's worthwhile here. At least it's long, so let me find the, the okay, so. Um, in the text it reads, we have no knowledge of how this unconscious functions, but since it is conjectured to be a psychic system, it may possibly have everything that consciousness has, including perception, a perception, memory, imagination, will, affectivity, feeling, reflection, judgment, etc., all in subliminal forms. And the footnote reads, uh, G. H. Lewis, the physical basis of mind, London, 1877, takes all this for granted. For instance, on page 358, he says, science has various modes and degrees, such as perception, ideation, emotion, volition, which may be conscious, subconscious, or unconscious. On page 363, consciousness and unconsciousness are correlatives, both belonging to the sphere of sentence, of sentience. Every one of the unconscious processes is operant, changes the general state of the organism, and is capable of at once issuing in a discriminated sensation when the force which balances it is disturbed. On page 367, there are many involuntary actions of which we are distinctly conscious and many voluntary actions of which we are at times subconscious or unconscious. Just as the thought which at one moment passes unconsciously at another consciously, it is in itself the same thought. So the action which at one moment is voluntary and at another involuntary is itself the same action. Lewis certainly goes too far when he says on page 373, there is no real and essential distinction between voluntary and involuntary actions. Occasionally, there is a world of difference. So, okay, that is that. Is that. So, Tomorrow, um, this essay gets more and more interesting as we go into it. Um, so far, um, Dr. Jung has been warming up to the pitch, but I've, I've been reading ahead and it, it gets quite interesting. So I will be reading um, the next part, which is part three, uh, tomorrow after our advanced reading group session. So I look forward to uh, seeing you then. I thank you all for uh, being here and uh, I look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye.